there's a spiritual revolution taking place. It's been happening for, for thousands of years, and we get to be a part of that revolution today. And by revolution, I mean exactly what the book of Acts talks about. It, it says that the people of God were literally turning the world upside down. Right? There's, there's something going on through God's power that is turning our world on its head. I think Paul talks about it the same way in 1 Corinthians. He says, God takes the, the strong things of the world and shows them to be weak. Takes the wise things of the world to call them foolish. We are part of a spiritual revolution. Now, here's the thing with spiritual revolution. It requires spiritual power and spiritual weapons. And I don't know about you, but I oftentimes forget about that. I oftentimes forget that our battle's not against flesh and blood, but against unseen forces. And, and I'm, I'm reticent to, to, to lean on the spiritual power that's a, available to me and to realize that there's spiritual weapons. You know what those weapons are? They're things like prayer. And they're things like the Word. And there's, there's this thing called the Spirit. And today we get to discover what, what that's about, that, that the God who has been doing this revolution for, for, for centuries is still doing it today, and he's using you, people like you and me. And we need to be reminded of this because I don't know about you, but don't you ever have those moments during the week where you sit there and go, we have definitely lost uh, touch with what it means to be human beings and to live in the civilization. I had a moment like that this week where, um, if you don't know about it, but there's this, this, this movement afoot where people are buying up virtual property in the metaverse. No, seriously, here was the lead story this week. I read, I couldn't believe it. It was on CNBC, and they said someone literally paid $400,000 to buy a digital electronic home in the metaverse so that they could be Snoop Dogg's neighbor. Now, I don't know about you. I would love to be Snoop Dogg's neighbor. He would be an awesome neighbor, wouldn't he? You might not remember much, but you, it would be fun to be his neighbor. Um, but someone literally paid in the metaverse to buy property that's not even real, tangible, or tactile, $400,000 to be Snoop Dogg's neighbor. And you sit there and you go, there goes humanity. Darwin Award of the Year. Can we get more stupid than that? I sit there and go, I think we can. Yeah. I think we can. People taking their livelihood, their resources, and investing in things that aren't even real. And I say and go, we are desperate to understand the revolution that's happening. See, we have to realize that people are buying into lies all the time. They're buying into things that aren't important. They're buying into things that they think are going to bring them worth and value and significance. And, and those of us who are in Jesus Christ, we know that only in Christ there is worth and value and significance. That he came to... To, to give his life for people like you and me so that we no longer will be drinking stale, stagnant water out of a well that continues to be deplenished, but we drink from the fountain of him who is the life, who is the living waters, whose water never ends. Amen? But we need power to take this message to the world. We need the power to, to, to realize that the spiritual revolution is happening. It requires spiritual power and spiritual weapons, which oftentimes we're forgetful of. And we come to a passage like Acts chapter 1. So turn there in your Bibles, if you would. Acts chapter 1, uh, we're going to be looking at verses 6 through 11, which really still serves as this introduction to the book of Acts. The first 11 chapters, which we're on our third week, first 11 verses of chapter 1, we're on our third week of just understanding this introduction because all the things we're talking about sets the stage for the entire book. That it is awesome to consider that God is still working today. He's still turning people's lives upside down. He's still calling what the world calls wise, foolish, and he's still calling what the world calls strong, weak, so that Christ may be glorified and exalted and be known as king over all. So we turn to the book of Acts, chapter 1. If you're there, hopefully you're there. There is something worth living for. There's something greater worth living for. This is what we need to be reminded of. And what I love about this, we're going to talk about the ascension this morning. The ascension. When was the last time you heard a sermon on the, the ascension of Jesus? 
right? Uh, we, there is on your calendar, you can look at it, you know, when you go home, there is Ascension Day on the calendar, right? It's 40 days after Easter. Here's, here's the things we get right. We get, we get Good Friday right. We get Easter Sunday right. One thing we probably are, are, are remiss in is understanding Ascension Day. The day that Jesus was lifted from this visible world and entered into a realm is unseen to our physical eyes. But I'm going to tell you right now, ascension is a powerful truth, which we're going to talk about this morning. Matter of fact, it's so powerful that church history includes it in the, the Apostles' Creed. It includes it in the Nicene Creed. It's something that the early church really, really wanted to spend time understanding. But yet us in our contemporary churches... We fail in remembering it. The ascension of Christ. Yes, it's mysterious. Yes, it's ambiguous in a lot of ways. But yet, there's a lot in the scriptures that tell us about Christ's ascension. We're going to talk about that today. But Luke is the only one that mentions the ascension of Jesus in his, in his writings. Matter of fact, he mentions it twice. And whenever something's mentioned at least twice, you've got to go, all right, what do we got to pay attention to? So hold your place in Acts 1. Look up on the screen at Luke chapter 24. The last chapter, the last verses of the Gospel of Luke. Luke wrote the Gospel of Acts. He also write, uh, write the uh, Gospel of Luke. He also writes the book of Acts. Notice the overlapping themes that we're going to look at this morning. Look at Luke chapter 24. He says, the message that you are to communicate to the world, the revolutionary message is this. Repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Isn't this what everyone wants to be freed from? We're, we're trapped in our sins. There's a Savior who comes to liberate us. Woohoo! Repentance for the, for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name because there's no other way to be free but, but be free in Jesus. Amen? And you're going to take that message to all the nations. Every single tribe, tongue, people, group, everywhere. Beginning from Jerusalem... Your ministry always starts with where you're at. Your ministry could be in, in, in South East, Southeast Asia. It could be in Europe. But as far as right now, wherever you are, that's where your ministry is. Amen? You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. What's the promise? That Jesus has to depart in order to impart the Spirit to live within us. Because better the Spirit within you than the Jesus beside you. Remember we talked about that last week? We need spiritual power to do spiritual work. The promise is the Spirit's going to dwell with us. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power on high. you got to wait. Some of us don't like to hear the, the message of waiting, right? you got to stop. you got to be still. you got to wait to be clothed with power. And he led them out as far as Bethany and lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple blessing God. That's how Luke ends. Notice how he dovetails this same message in the beginning of the book of Acts. So if you have your Bibles open, I hope you do. Look at Acts chapter 1, starting at verse 4. And gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, right? We already read that. He commanded them to wait for what the Father had promised, right, which was the coming of the, of the Spirit. He said, you heard from me, verse, uh, verse 5, for John baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now, right? Because spiritual work requires spiritual empowerment. And then the disciples, in verse 6, ask, Lord, is this the time that you're restoring the kingdom of Israel? Right? They, they know the scriptures. They know that the king is going to establish a kingdom. They're thinking, oh, there's a program happening. There's, there's this plan. And then Jesus turns to them in kind of like a wah-wah moment. Look at verse 7. It is not for you to know the times or the ages which the Father has fixed by his own authority. There are things that you will never know. How many of us have a hard time hearing that phrase and accepting it? I'm, I'm a KIA in my house. You know what KIA stands for? Know-it-all. Not, I don't drive a Kia. I'm just a know-it-all kind of person. I like to know everything. And how many times God shows up and goes, you're not going to know this. You, you're not going to know this, and I, you, may never know, you may never know it, and I have to sit there and be okay with that, right? So Jesus says, you know what, that's none of your business in a loving, gracious kind of way, but there is your business, and it's this. You're going to be my witnesses. Verse 8, look at this. 
And I'm going to tell you, verse 8 is the key verse for the entire book of Acts. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you are going to be my witnesses, not only in Jerusalem, but Judea, Samaria, and even to the remotest parts of the world. That's the book of Acts in one verse. Jerusalem is chapters 1 through 7. Judea, Samaria is chapters 8 through 12. And the remotest parts of the world are chapters 13 to the end. He says, you are going to be clothed with power, you will be my witnesses, and you will go to the furthest reaches of the globe, communicating the kingdom is coming. And then verse 9. And after he had said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking into the sky, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And they were gazing intently into the sky while he was departing. And behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them. And he said to the, they said to the disciples, Men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking up into the sky? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in the, just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. May God write his eternal truths on our hearts this morning. Five things I want to tease out of this text this morning for us that I think are good reminders when it comes to spiritual power. I, I want every single person in this room to be used of God, to do great things for God's kingdom. But we cannot do it without his power. And I think there's five things we see here that are good reminders. And if you're not blessed by them, all I know is I was convicted by them this week. So let me live out of my conviction for you this morning, all right? Five things. Take out your notes. Short pencil is better than a long memory. Point number one, great power. Spiritual power is greater than programs. We we love programs. We love, like, how to do it type books, right? Like, we wish we just had Jesus for dummies, right? All I need to do is just study 20 pages, get my XYZ, we're good to go. I'm going to tell you right now, God's going to break, if you're a program type person, God's going to break you out of that mentality. The disciples want to know the program. The disciples are going, okay, God, so let me get this, X plus Y equals Z, is that right? And God is telling them, I'm not going to give you a detailed strategy of what I'm doing. See, program info is the where, the when, the how. And, and wouldn't it be just like us to know, like, what about the day? What, if I knew the program about my life the day I was going to die, what would that do? I'm glad I don't know. There's no expiration date on my birth certificate. Do you have one on there? I, I don't have one on mine. But it would be damaging to us. If we knew the day we were going to die, or the day my wife was going to die, or the day my children was going to die, we, we live in this shroud of mystery that God says, I'm not going to give you a detailed strategy of the where, the when, the how. What, what God gives us, and, and, and I want you to just, to, just to, to reflect on this, here's what God gives us, and it's greater than a program. The Bible says he gives us the mind of Christ. Write that down, Colossians chapter 3. You have been given the mind of Jesus. It's like sitting in a boardroom, and there's the CEO, and he hands out this this three-ring binder with his plan for the company, and you sit there and go, oh, if I only follow these things, then I'm going to do well for the company, and the company will succeed. You know what the the, the CEO of the universe does? He says, I'm not going to give you a three-ring binder. I'm going to give you my brain. And when you're connected to the brain of the author and creator of life, when you're connected to this this God who is sovereign over everything, you have an organic connection. You don't need a program. God is not going to work through an impersonal program. He's going to work through a personal connection with himself. Can you write down the word organic? I know it's a word. Some of you are like, if you've been with me for any amount of time, I love the word organic, right? It's not just for Fry's expensive produce anymore. It's for the church. Yeah. Organic. Meaning, I don't want you to live your lives so rigid, so focused on a program where everything in your spiritual world is X, Y, Z. You need to realize God is going to work beyond the X, Y, Zs. And it comes through a living vibrant relationship with himself. He doesn't incarnate himself in programs. He houses himself in human beings. 
you are now a temple of the Holy Spirit. You have the mind of Christ. And here's what you have to accept. God is going to keep you in the dark about a lot of things. But what he has shined his light on is for you to live and obey. Deuteronomy 29, 29. This is a good verse. The secret things belong to the Lord our God. But the things that are revealed belong to us and our children forever that we may do all the words of this law. Is that not remarkable or what? Face it. You don't have to know everything. What you have to do is what you are given, you're called to obey. How many of us as parents have had those conversations with our kids? Go do that. And they go, why? Do you like living? That's why, right? Like, the moment you tell your child to do something or not do something, their, their natural, sinful, rebellious impulse is to question it. Why? There are things we do as parents that we understand why it's important to do or why it's important not to do. Our kids will eventually grow to learn that, and they may never fully understand why we make the decisions we make, but we do it why because we care for our children. And that's what God wants. He doesn't want your questioning. He wants your obedience. Great power comes to those who understand, I am organically connected to God. I've been given the mind of Christ, and I want to be so in tune with him that the moment he, he speaks, the moment he prompts, the moment he convicts, the moment he, I'm ready there. Even though I don't have it figured out, even though I don't have the program, he's working. And all God's people said, point number two, spiritual power greater than preparation. Here's, here's what the disciples have to do. And this would, this would rub up against any one of us who like to plan and prepare. Here's what Jesus says. I'm going to tell you great power is coming to you, but you got to go wait. you got to go be still. you got to go be inactive. You can't do anything. You just have to wait. How many of you would just be those, like, those eager beaver types? You know, I'm talking about disc personality analysis. Where, like you're the otters, the beavers, the manatees, whatever the animals are on those things. And you're sitting there going, all right, God wants me to do something. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to be busy with God. And I'm going to tell you right now, spiritual power doesn't come to those who are busy for God. Spiritual power comes to those who are being still for God. He says to the disciples who, they go back to Jerusalem. Remember the, the end of the book of Acts? They were filled with joy. And they're going back. It's almost like these guys are pumped to do something. And what does Jesus say to them? Go and wait. Go and be still. This is exactly like that whole Mary Martha scene from the Gospels. You remember this? There's two women that really stand as, a, as representative of the human race, right? There's those who know how to just be with Jesus, and there's those who know how to be busy for Jesus. There's Mary at the feet of Christ, just adoring him and, and loving him. And then there's Martha in the kitchen clanging her pots and pans because she's pissed off at Mary. And she says, Lord, tell Mary to get her butt in here and help me with the dishes. And Jesus says to Martha, what are you anxious about? Your sister has chosen the better thing right now. Mary, I, I, I'm glad you want to be busy, but busyness, preparing whatever you're preparing for Jesus, com doesn't compare to just being still. How, ma how many of you, just when I say that phrase, be still, you're almost like, oh, I wish I could. How many of you are so bombarded with the world's distractions? You know, you're the type of person that the moment you wake up, it's like you're immediately on your phone. Or you turn on the news, or you have to have something blaring, right? You, you don't like the absence of noise, right? You, you can't live in those still environments. And I, and I wonder what it would do to our souls if every morning we just made it a discipline to just take 15 minutes and just sat in silence. And, and, and maybe uttered the prayer of the psalmist, Be still and know that I am God. When was the last time you did that? 
See, so many of us, I think, being still requires us to spend like a, I've got to schedule three days and go to Sedona and live among the red rocks and listen to, you know, hang out in a, in a peyote hut or something. I don't know what your, your dream is of, of stillness or rest, but I'm going to tell you right now, stillness and rest can happen in those 15-minute increments every single day. Where you just sit there, I'm going to turn off the TV, I'm going to turn off the phone, and I'm just going to sit with my eyes closed and just ask the Lord, help me to just rest. There's nothing inherently wrong with being busy for God. But when you're busy operating out of a place where you haven't even just spent time just in silence and listening, it it could be deadly to your soul and your spirit. You're valued not for what you do. You're valued for who you are. You are created in God's image. Stop. And be still that, and know that not only is he God, he's your God. Who's, who's giving you this label, and you're my children. You're his, you're his sons, you're his daughters. I would never want to have a relationship with a parent where it was all about my performance. It was all about what I could do and how I could prepare. I want a relationship with a, with a, a, a parent that says, you are loved because you are part of this family no matter what you do. How many, how many of us need to hear that? It's, it's not about preparation. It's about surrender. How many times a day do we have to surrender our hearts? How many times a day do we just have to yield to the, the Spirit? Lord, remove every bit of me and come and completely take over my life. That's what it means to be filled with the Spirit. To be filled with the Spirit completely means I must be empty of Scott Morgan completely. Insert name there. (laughs) He says to the disciples, go wait. Can you imagine being in that room? And we're going to see the scene next week when the Spirit starts showing up and doing something remarkable in men and women who are surrendered and yielded and doing nothing. It seems like it can't be true. Spiritual power comes to those who are empty of themselves. Point number three. Spiritual power that's greater than promoters. Here's the problem with programs and and preparation. Is that you become a promoter for the king, and God doesn't want you to be a promoter. You know, when I hear promoter, I think salesman, I think recruiter. Someone who perhaps peddles a product that they themselves may not believe in. Notice what it says in verse 8. You're going to wait, the Spirit's going to come, and you will be my witnesses. Notice it doesn't say salesman. Aren't you glad it doesn't say, you're going to be my recruiter. God doesn't need you to sell the kingdom. He doesn't need you to recruit people to be a part of some sort of, you know, pyramid scheme. He needs witnesses. You know what the word witness means? Circle in your Bibles, write down the word martyr. That's the word. And it's used 39 plus times in the book of Acts. You know what a martyr is? A martyr is someone who so believes what they represent, they're willing to give their lives for it. You will be my witnesses, not only with where you're at, but where I'm going to take you. And there's a world that is waiting for such authentic believers. And I say authenticity because we live in a world that's very inauthentic. And what I mean by that is perhaps the most recent study done out of Wales, I'm Welsh, praise God for the Welsh people, amen, I have Welsh, Welsh ancestry, so uh, University of Cardiff did this study, and you're not going to believe this study, but the study had to do with mask wearing, like literally, like, you know, for the past couple of years, right, we've all, we've got more masks than we know what to do with, right, and they did a poll among women, and the women basically said, a group of women were asked to rate the looks of people both masked and maskless, and it wasn't even close, the masked people prevailed. You're more attractive with a mask on. 
It's so dumb, right? Was that my wife? It's so stupid, huh? Let's talk about this later. My wife goes, don't wear a mask. Just put a bag on your head. It's good for everybody, right? So, but isn't it interesting, right? Like, it's like you're more attractive if you wear a mask on your face. How defeating and, and is that? You know, I, I sit there and go, whether you're wearing a physical mask, and then we can talk about the, the metaphor of wearing a mask. Aren't we all wearing masks? And, and here's what the Spirit invites us into. Here's where great power erupts. When you are so transparent and vulnerable that people see your weaknesses, but somehow the strength of God shows up. It's what Paul says. His strength is made perfect in our weaknesses. This Promoters are selling you on something that they themselves may not believe in. But also, when you know you're being sold something, you almost feel a little bit violated. Like, you're you're not telling me the real deal here. Believers are called to be the real deal. Witnesses are people who communicate something that has powerfully and deeply impacted their lives. When you take the stand in a courtroom as a witness... The judge doesn't care what your ideas and opinions are for any such topic. They want to know what you have experienced. What have you heard? What have you seen? Here's what I'm excited about for for you and I as we follow Jesus, is that when we go talk to people, we have an opportunity to be transparent and vulnerable and, and say things essentially like, I was once blind, but now I see because of God's help. I, I, I'm going to tell you right now that I have conversations with people uh, about marriage, about kids, and the moment you're willing to be transparent and vulnerable about how well you don't excel in those areas, like marriage and parenting, people almost see that as an entry point to, for them to share and talk about their shortfalls and their, and their struggles. I think so many times we've, we've put this kind of facade out there that we as Christians have it all together. I talk to people all the time who are like, I would never step foot in a church because those people have it all together. I sit there and go, you don't know my church. <laughs> you, you haven't been here to hang out with us. Like, they're like, I'm just not into organized religion. I say, well, welcome to Missio. We're so disorganized, we don't know what to do with it, right? But there's something organic and real about that. Yeah. Right? The conversations I have with people, they're like, you're a pastor? And it, I kind of go, what do you mean by that reaction like that, right? Like, you can be real and transparent and vulnerable. And I sit there and go, and you know what? God loves me. I'm a work in progress. God loves me. And I'm so thankful for that. And it's, it's inviting. When you're a witness to something you've deeply experienced yourself, you're not coming across as a, as a promoter or a salesperson. You know, like those people that come to our doors on a Saturday, and they're like, hey, can I tell you about another gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ? You're kind of like, no, I don't, right? Elder Bill and Elder Don, right? Whatever, whoever, elders at 18 years of age or however old you are. And they come to your door, and you know what? It just seems so disingenuous. Why? Because they're, they're selling something. And I'm going to tell you right now, the Spirit does not counterfeit himself. The Spirit duplicates the life of Christ in his people. People who knock on your doors are counterfeits. They don't understand the meaning of relationship. They want you to join a club. They want you to join a system, but it's devoid of relationship. And whether you want to call those people Mormons or whether you want to call those people Jehovah's Witnesses, whatever they are, they're a cult and they're devoid of relationship. It's a counterfeit, not a duplicate. And they don't, they don't come across as, they are coming across as if they have to earn something to save their souls. You have the opportunity to have them sit down at your table and break out the entomens and the coffee and sit there and go, can I tell you something? You don't have a system to join or a club to join. I'm going to tell you about a Savior who loves you as you are where you are. And you don't have anything to do to earn that. It's a free gift. It's called grace. Woohoo! See, that's what we're witness to. And people have yet to break out of that workspace mentality. Witnesses who deeply and powerfully and personally have come into this reality that Jesus has cleaned us of our sins and habits our hearts. There's this confidence. 
You ever met people so connected to Jesus, there's this assurance and confidence that they sit there and go, I've tasted and seen that the Lord is good. Would, would you taste and see with me? We're in this, we're in this journey together. I remember uh, reading about, so I, I like church history. I know, geek, nerdy stuff. There's this preacher by the name of George Whitfield. He, uh, he and Jonathan Edwards, 1700s, great awakening, spiritual uh, awakening happening all over, especially in England and, and America. Whitfield would preach these sermons. He'd get people in his audience like a guy named David Hume. If you've ever studied philosophy, he was a philosopher and a skeptic. He would go and hear Whitfield preach. And someone caught him along the way and said, Hume, <laughs> you certainly don't believe the gospel, do you? As if that's a way to win over somebody, right? Like, <laughs> you don't believe the gospel, do you? He says, I don't, but that guy does. And I go because he is passionate for what he believes. And I sit there and go, could it be that when you become a witness to the Lord Jesus Christ, even the skeptics are somewhat attracted to what's going on in your life. Could, could it be that your earnestness and your desire to honor the Lord invites others who it may not be at that place yet where you're at with Christ, but there's something about your life that's genuine, and, and, and they, want, they, want to, they want to be exposed to that. I pray you're the kind of people that attracts even the skeptics because you don't come across as a recruiter or a promoter. You're the genuine article. Is God bringing you people like that? And, and I'm going to tell you, here's the key. Be open and transparent and vulnerable about, about your lives. I remember talking to someone the other day here at, here at Missio, and they said, you know what? One of the things I appreciate about you, Scott, is that you're open and transparent about your life. And I said, yeah, only about 5%, because if I was truly open and transparent, we'd be here all week, and you'd have to quit your jobs, because you're listening to sc how Scott Morgan fails and falters on a continual basis. It happens. <laughs> Ask my wife. She's right there. Ask my kids. They're here. But you know what? Stop. Here's the thing. I'm okay with that. I'm okay with anything that's happened this past week with me, and how maybe I didn't measure up as a husband or as a father. You know why? Because I'm in unconditionally loved by Jesus. And while I may have my warts and my, 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 my shortcomings, you're always going to see a smile on my face because there's a God who loves me unconditionally. That's what it means to be a witness. Amen? Amen. And we need to love one another like that, don't we? Instead of keeping track of how we've hurt one another, boy, we're all going to hurt each other. Let's just give it, put it out there. It is what it is. We have a God who loves us, who's going to use us. Imperfect, weak people like us, spiritual power is going to show up in great ways. Point number four, spiritual power greater than perspective. So now the ascension. So I, I, I set it up earlier. You're going, when are we going to talk about the ascension? Here we are, verse nine. So you're going to be my witnesses from Jerusalem to Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the world, right? There's not a place in this globe, that the gospel's not meant to go to. And, and we'll talk about this later, the, the, the tens of thousands of people groups that have yet to hear the message of Jesus. That's amazing. We have a work to do with that. But Christ, verse 9, is taken away. It's what we call the ascension. Look at verse 9, Acts chapter 1, verse 9. And while he had said these things, so notice, we have just touched on the final words of Christ in his earthly ministry. These are the final words which we just unpacked. Having said all that he needed to say, he was then lifted up while they were looking on and a cloud received him from their sight. It's like the, the, the Shekinah glory cloud. I don't know if you're familiar with that phrase, but in the Old Testament, this, this supernatural cloud would appear when God was doing something radical. Well, the same cloud comes and it, Christ disappears. He, he didn't cease to become human. He didn't some, become some vaporized deity. You know, he was just, he was lifted up and removed from, from anything that our physical eyes could ever comprehend or, or see. And, and there's something powerful here because 
at verse 9, we almost think like, all right, Jesus is gone. <laughs> what do we do? Perhaps Jesus is more active unseen than he was ever active seen. L let, me, let me argue something with you. Like I said, the ascension of Christ, I believe, is essential to the gospel. What the ascension means, what Christ is doing now is essential to the gospel. But you're sitting there going, but verse 9 doesn't tell us anything. I'm going to tell you right now that the New Testament is filled with what Christ is doing right now in the unseen realms. I want you to write down three words in, under this point. I want you to write down the words prophet, priest, king. And if you've never studied the threefold ministry of Christ, let me just tell you, get ready for, for a, a Bible study that will keep you busy for the rest of your lives. Christ is not only prophet, not only is he priest, but he is king. And not only was he those threefold offices here on earth, he still occupies those offices in heaven right now. Here's what we believe about the ascension, and this is why perspective is so important, because I don't know about you, I get limited in my understanding of what God is doing, because, oh, what's unseen leads to ignorance in my life. What is unseen leads to this absent-mindedness in my life, and I want you to know now that one of the aspects of power is us being aware of what Christ is doing right now, because it's not like he's up there playing shuffleboard because all his work on earth is done. Can I get an amen from somebody? When the disciples saw him taken away, this is not only what we call the ascension of Christ, this is the exaltation of Christ. This is the rightful king of the universe being seated at the right hand of the Father on high, being coronated as king over all. He's reigning, he's ruling, the kingdom is still breaking into this world, but he's occupying a place of victory and conquering because the work is done. He is right now making an enemy under, under his feet as a footstool. That's what Psalms chapter 110 verse 1 tells us. See, he's a prophet in the sense that he is the communicator of what we need to know as far as truth. He is the one who is coming alongside and reminding us of truth, and he's doing it through the spirit of truth, which is the Holy Spirit. And if you have the mind of Christ, well, guess what's happening? You are now being told the truth through this conduit called the Holy Spirit. He's still acting as prophet, telling us what we need to do, what the will of God is about, the ways of God. But he's also priest. Do not forget the fact that you have this, this savior, this conquering king who is also a priest. And you know what the priest does? The priest goes to bat for his people. He intercedes for them day and night. He mediates on their behalf. He is an advocate for his people. And I don't know about you, but the priestly aspect of Christ and what he's doing right now, when the Bible tells me that day and night he intercedes for me, I sit there and go, thank you, because I don't know how to intercede for myself. Can I tell you right now that there are times when I don't know what to say. There's times I don't know what to do. There's times I want to pray something because I'm hurt so deeply and I don't know how to articulate it. The Bible says the Holy Spirit translates my groanings into words that the Father can understand. And that's the mediator role of Jesus as he sits there and goes, I will be the go-between. There's no mediator between God and man but the person of Jesus Christ. And right now he is mediating and interceding for you and I. And not only that, he's an advocate for us. You are his and there's nothing this world could ever do to take you away from that position. You are his forever. Romans chapter 8, neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor things present nor things to come will ever separate you from the love of Jesus Christ, right? He is your priest forever. And you have nothing to fear because when you have an advocate like Christ pleading your case before the Father, interceding for you, mediating for you, you have everything on your side. But not only that, he is their king. He is reigning he is ruling. The enemies are being placed as a footstool under his feet. And his victory is final. And his ascension means the kingdom has now been inaugurated. The kingdom is breaking into the world and it is taking over the hearts of men and women because that's where the kingdom is most deeply felt in our hearts. And now that the kingdom is inaugurated, we know one day he's coming back. Just like the angel said, the way he, re he returned, he left, he, same way he's going to return, visibly, dramatically, literally. And he is going to come as the king who has the right to judge. And he is breaking into this world with his kingdom. And he's taking over hearts and lives like yours and mine. And you know what, I, I sit there and go, what am I fearful of? What, what am I uncertain of? What, what do I lack confidence in? Because the world is continually feeding us 
false truths about ourselves and the world we live in. And when you lose perspective of what's true, the, the coronated king who's reigning right now, you lack spiritual power. It's all about what, where your mind is dwelling and what your heart's embracing. If, if I continue to live with the fact that there is a God who's reigning on high, who sent his son to die for me, and, and that, 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 that Lord, that king is at the right hand of the Father right now interceding for me, if I leave with it, live with this constant awareness of that, I tell you what, that's going to change my perspective. It's going to change my perspective of my marriage and my kids and my work and my friends and my neighbors and the government and all the wars and rumors of wars and famines that are going on. I'm sitting here going, if this king is not only the king of this world, he's also the king of the universe, king of realms unseen. It's just like that quote where it says, every square inch of the universe is claimed by Jesus and counterclaimed by Satan. Because Satan's always trying to edge his way in there to reap fear in your hearts. And we're reminded because of perspective of what the Bible says. Nothing's out of God's control. I mean, think about this. Ladies and gentlemen, while you went to bed last night, Jesus was still subduing his enemies. <laughs> while you were sleeping, he was taking all the nebula out there, all those pictures that those telescopes bring back, and you and I sit there and go, oh. Jesus is like, it's all working out in the palm of my hand. And not only that, he was sustaining your life while you slept. You ever thought about the ability to sleep and not be in control of the fact that you're breathing? Like, I've stayed up at times thinking, oh, I don't want to stop breathing. And God just says, go to bed, rest. Let me take it. He's the one suspending your life. You think you're in control? You're not. There's someone, someone greater in control. While you slept, he was continuing to rule over this world. He's a God who knows everything that's taking place. He's, the, the universe hangs in the balance in his sovereign control. And he's sitting there going, what, what are you worried about? You, you saw me leave. I'm coming back. And he's coming back as the rightful king who's able to judge the world. Good news is he's not going to judge us who are in Christ. He's going to reward us for faithfulness and how we live for his glory, right? This is why we want to talk about that at some point in our, our Acts journey. But for those who are far from him, he's going to judge them. Philippians chapter 2 says, One day every tongue will confess and every knee will bow and acknowledge him as Lord. I'm in the camp that says, I want to do that. I don't want to be in the camp that says, I'm forced to do that. That's the difference. Let me, I'm going to share with you a couple Old Testament passages. Daniel chapter 7. This, for me, this just, it brings this aspect of the ascension home, that Christ has been exalted, he has been coronated, he's been glorified, he, he is, he's in that place of, of victory at the Father's right hand, he's He's bringing all the plans of God to fulfillment. One day, he's going to consummate the entire plan. We don't know when that is, right? Because remember, he hasn't exposed that part of the program to us. But look what Daniel says. Daniel, chapter 7, sees a vision of the ascension of Jesus. I, some of you maybe have grown up in a church tradition where this was seen as like some sort of rapture event and Jesus coming back. This is the ascension. Notice the scene. Daniel looks up and he sees the throne room of heaven. That's the location. And as I look, thrones were placed. And the Ancient of Days took a seat. You know who the Ancient of Days is? God, the Father. Ancient of Days took a seat. His clothing was white as snow and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames. Its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and came out from before him. And thousand thousand served him. And ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court sat in judgment. And the books were opened. 
And I looked, then, because of the sound of the great words that the horn was speaking. And as I looked, the beast was killed, and its body destroyed, given over to be burned with fire. As for the rest of the beast, their dominion was taken away. Their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. And I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. Son of man, Jesus' favorite phrase for himself. In those clouds, that son of man came. And he came to the ancient days and was presented before him. Now, remind, I want to remind you, perhaps one of the greatest aspects of the ascension is the reuniting of father and son. Did not Jesus say in, in Luke, uh, John 16, verse 7, I go back to be with my father. Greatest reunion ever in history. And to him, the Son of Man, was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all the peoples and nations and languages should should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. Woo! See what Daniel sees here? is exactly what Christ has come to do. Shatter the kingdoms of the world and establish his one and only eternal kingdom. This is not new to Daniel. Daniel chapter 2, the statue of Nebuchadnezzar, the small stone that comes and crumbles all the kingdoms, that is also a picture of the ascended, conquering, victorious Christ. How does that change your perspective? Don't we need to be reminded of these things? This world will fade away, but the kingdom of Christ will reign forever. Can I give you one more passage? Psalm 24. Even the psalmist, I believe, saw a picture of the ascended Christ. And the psalmist writes these words, Lift up your heads, O gates! And be lifted up, O ancient doors! And let the King of glory come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, and the King of glory glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Selah. You know what Selah means? Rest. How many of us need to make this our prayer? Lift up your heads. Why you downcast? Are you not part of God's victorious people? Have your hearts not come to embrace the true kingdom that reigns forever? Have you not been rescued from your sins? Have you not been now given sight who were once blind? Have you not been given new life who were living this wretched existence? Who is the king of the glory? The glory is belonging to Jesus who has saved me and saved you. Why you downcast? Lift up your heads. Our God is mighty in battle. He is strong. He is the one who is going to be glorified forever. And guess what? For some reason, we're on his team. That's perspective. This is what we need to remind them. But we're so busy, distracted. Stop. Do you know this king? Has he taken over your life? I pray he has. Spiritual power comes when you keep an eternal perspective. Which I have to touch on this last point and we're done. Spiritual power is greater than our perplexities. <laughs> so Jesus is lifted up, verse 9. And uh, what does it say, verse 10? And they were gazing intently into the sky. Here's how I envision them gazing intently. There's a lot of mystery. Granted, there is supernatural work taking place. Can I tell you right now that walking with Jesus, you're going to be perplexed. That's a given. There's going to be a lot of bewilderment. God doesn't offer a lot of explanations. This is why the angels have to go, men of Galilee, why do you stand there gazing intently at the sky? You've got work to do. Spiritual power is not available to those who live in the curious, 
who live in the mysterious, who live in the realm of speculation. Spiritual power comes to those who are ready to do what God wants them to do. Remember, these men and women had a mission. Their mission wasn't to be just stargazing. It was meant to be witnesses. How many of us are so consumed with speculating crazy things and mysterious things of the Bible that we have lost touch with just being a witness to my neighbor, my coworker, my family member? Stop trying to figure out the hidden codes of the Bible, which don't exist. And just start speaking boldly and courageously about Jesus to the person that are, that's dying without him. Zeal for the king is connected to a zeal for the kingdom. And perhaps you're not ze zealous enough for, for Christ because you've lost that perspective of what's important. God doesn't care if Adam had a belly button or not. God doesn't care about how many angels can dance on the head of, an, of a pin, right? There's things that we speculate that the Bible is not clear on. Those are the things that might be fun to talk about for five minutes, but your life is to be devoted to be witnesses, not stargazers. Not to become, you know, argumentative when it comes to some mysterious thing of the scriptures. Let me just tell you right now, too many of us are distracted with that kind of stuff. Some of you are like, oh, vaccinations, you know, it's, a, it's the mark of the beast. It's the chips that are being implanted. Like, and there's Christians that spend their lives like researching this stuff. I sit there and go, hey, I got a better idea. Be concerned about the soul of your neighbor. Can I get an amen? We're talking about things that I think when we meet the Lord face to face, you know what he's going to do? He's going to go, <sighs> you spent 20 hours? doing that and you haven't even given 20 seconds to praying for the, the lost person you work with enter into the joy of your master <laughs> he'll give us one of these like <laughs> get in there first corinthians 3 says some of you are going to barely make it you're going to smell burnt hair on your way into eternity but you know what we're, we're to live for bigger things amen the things you are to build your lives with are the things that the fire of judgment will not destroy. The pure metals, the pure materials, some of you are building with wood, hay, straw, and when the fires of God's judgment happen, those things will be consumed, and you will be mournful of how you wasted your lives. Life is filled with perplexities, but you want to know what's not a perplexity? The fact that if you've been saved, you're to be a witness and to be a messenger of the salvation that you have tasted so greatly of. You've been blessed to be a blessing. That's what the book of Acts is going to show us. Boy, there's something better to live for. Are you part of the revolution? Viva la revolution! <laughs> Jesus' revolution. Fought with spiritual power fought with spiritual weapons, stuff that we're going to grow and learn and hopefully glorify our God in as we journey with Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Let's stand, let's pray. Father, thank you for just being so gracious to us. You, you put up with us, and, and, I, and I, think, I, I speak for myself. How many times I get so easily distracted and just so off the... The, the, the will that you have clearly laid out for me, and yet it's times like this, you, you bring me back to what's important. Find us to be faithful. Find us to be obedient. Find us to be a surrendered people so that we can live for, for a glory beyond ourselves and a kingdom that we could never establish with our own strength. Thankful that you are still at work changing the hearts of men and women. Even as we speak, men or women are surrendering their lives to Jesus. Have us be a part of that, that work. May we find joy in serving the risen and exalted and coronated king of the universe. 
thank you for inviting us into your family. Let us glorify you in all things. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face toward you and give you his grace and peace forever and ever.